If you're in entrepreneurship and you're telling people you want to help people, well, you know, you're not really going to help people unless you create financial wealth. Yeah, that was like entrepreneurship 101. <laughs> and then it all went away. And I was door knocking, which is just a disaster. So in 2008, you went from over a $10 million net worth to nearly bankrupt. It was, it was a horrendous time. So this guy is one of the truest Gs when it comes to it, just actually creating success and creating freedom. What I love most about this guy is the tenacity in him and the fact that he's created so much incredible things in his life already. My man, Mr. Adam Hudson. Australia is undergoing a massive amount of change right now. Mainstream media is dying. It doesn't make sense. Do you think entrepreneurs are born or created? Oof. It's all the non-sexy stuff. Non-sexy stuff. All right, guys, say we're sitting down with one of the top entrepreneurs here in Australia. So this guy has done, in their first five years study out in the education business, they did $75 million in sales. At one point, had them one of the top education companies here in Australia, teaching people how to create money online. So this guy is one of the truest Gs when it comes to it, just actually creating success and creating freedom. He's also a serial entrepreneur and a massive property investor. But what I love most about this guy is the tenacity in him and the fact that he's created so much incredible things in his life already and he's just not stopping with his brand new company getting started soon that we're going to talk all about. So please, my man, Mr. Adam Hudson. Nice to see you, Nelson. Thank you for having me on the show. Dude, I'm super excited to have a conversation with you. Uh, it's funny, when I first got into entrepreneurship, um, your name was definitely one that's been floated around. So like, as we were just talking before we got recording, it's like, People here in Australia, I think, definitely used to the word Adam Hudson. Yeah. Um, which is really cool. So I really, I'm excited to have a chat with you. So, but when I was putting together all the information of you and reading your bio, you've been in business since 21, right? And so- The age of 21, not 2021. <laughs> the age of 21. Yeah. So you've been in business and entrepreneurship for quite a while now. I'm curious to know, how have you seen entrepreneurship and business change and mold over the decades? Yeah, so um, that was 30 years ago when I started in business, nearly 30 years. Um, and I think the biggest thing is just the scale uh, and access that people have today. Young people coming up today have so much more access to global opportunities, access to large markets, the ability to grow large audiences quickly. Uh, we just didn't have those things. You know, I came up in the day where when I was in my early 20s, oh, maybe in my late teens, early 20s, email came out, you know, that's, that I'm 50 now. So the idea of um, getting these companies that I see now, young people today scaling and getting such big dollars for their businesses so quickly through social media and all those things, it's just mind blowing to me what's possible uh, from a technology and, and uh, leverage point of view. Yeah. it's. Do, do you think it's made entrepreneurship easier or harder because at the same time there's so much comparison and stuff as well and i've seen so many people these days think they should get into entrepreneurship because everyone's doing it and then perhaps they have pressure on themselves to do things that maybe they don't want to do what do you think about it i think there's definitely a lot more advantages now because aside from the technological advances the access that you guys have the young people listening to this to knowledge like just before i got on the podcast when i was driving here i was listening to an interview with elon musk um, back in the day, billionaires like Elon Musk were like these figures that you would see a print article about them mm. once a year in the BRW rich list. You never got to hear them actually talk. Uh, you didn't even know what their voice sounded like. Young people today can sit down and listen to a two hour long form podcast with someone like Elon Musk or any of these incredible entrepreneurs and you can learn and just fast track your knowledge just so much quicker. So. I think while young people coming up do have definite disadvantages in certain areas when it comes to entrepreneurship, education is so critical to it and the central to it that I think there's there's huge advantages for young people coming up. Do you think entrepreneurship, do you think entrepreneurs are born or created? Well, um, I think it's probably a bit of both. I think we're born with some natural skills, but I think um, it depends on what happens to you in life as well that determines um, where the drive comes from. Um, so I think it's a combination of nature and nurture when it comes to entrepreneurship. Was there something that happened to you that you can pinpoint that made you turn into an entrepreneur? Yeah, and, it, and it's not positive. Um, you know, like I, I remember being at a Tony Robbins seminar when I was like 24 or something, right? So I'd already been in business a few years. I'd already made my first million by then. 
was very driven. Uh, I lost the first million soon after. That's another story. But um, I went to the Tony Robbins seminar and, and unpacked where my drive came from. And I realized it came from a stand-up argument with my dad in the hallway of our family home. And basically, you know, we were three boys and my mum and dad, and dad was the only worker. And as kids, you don't appreciate the pressure that your parents might be under as a single income home. Like, you know, it's, it's tough. And, you know, we had this argument. He was always tight with money because he probably had to be. And I, and, I, and I was like, well, I want to do this. And he was like, well, if you want to do it, then you can live in your own home. When you live under your own home and you can make the rules, right? Like most teenage arguments. And at that moment, I decided I'm going to make more money than my dad. And that's where my drive came from was like, I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to prove them, you know. And so, you know, a lot of times when you dig beneath highly successful people, whether it's sports people, whether it's entrepreneurs, they they have enemies and those enemies give passion to their business plans. Patrick Bet David talks about this. He's just about uh, just got a book about to come out called Choose Your Enemies Wisely. And Patrick says, you know, you've got to never let a good enemy go to waste because they can provide the drive and the passion to prove people wrong. Elon Musk is the same. He's proved people wrong over and over and over. He uses them for fuel. So I think that's part of the nurture. What happens to you coming up that determines how much drive you've got and how much you care. Yeah. So there's two biggest motivating forces in all human behavior, to gain pleasure or to avoid pain. Yeah. And somebody asked me this the other day, like, do you think using pain is um, useful? And I'm like, I think 100 million percent. Yeah. Because there's so many successful people I've met, spoken to, interviewed, that have all said nearly the same thing. They've had either come from some sort of chip on their shoulder or eventually be like, I'm going to show you, or a strong desire to not be broke yes. or to not have this. And it's what gets them going. Uh, I think where it wouldn't become a problem would if that's the only thing that right. continually drives us forever, right? Yeah, totally. Do you remember a point, where did it change for you where instead of being driven by, I've got to have this so I've got more money than dad, where did it then pivot to something that's more pulling you versus pushing you? Oh, I've still got enemies. <laughs> don't, yeah. don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, I mean, the longer that you're in business, enemies take all kinds of forms, right? So business partners that have quit on you, wives or girlfriends that left you because they thought you would never amount to anything, right? Yeah. Um, uh, there's the enemies come in a lot of shapes. And um, so, you know, I've still got people who root for me to fail, right? Like anybody who's out there doing anything at scale. So I still have those drives. And I also have positive drives, like, you know, wanting to provide for you know, my family in different ways and all that sort of stuff. So I still have both. I don't think it, it, there's ever a time for a, a real champion um, in life or sport or business or whatever that doesn't have people that are on their shit list, you know? So do you think it's just a bit of a fallacy then? Because I think like this day and age, especially in the younger generation, a lot of them are wanting to, I just want to help people. I want to impact. And I told someone the other day, actually, I said, unless your highest value is actually impact, that's not the driver. So stop kidding yourself. Like yeah. in the beginning, the driver is not, I just want to help people. Bullshit. Yeah. Unless your number one reason for living is impact yeah. and service, which is probably not. Um, we've all got a fundamental need to actually need to figure our own shit out first. So do you think it's a bit of a fallacy that people are fully into to go trying to have these extrinsic kind of motivators when actually um, they might be pushing aside what is really motivating yeah, I mean, if people, there's lots of discussion around this because, you know, at the end of the day, um, to really help people, um, there's, that can take many forms. So if that's your real motivation, you could be a school teacher, you could mm. be an ambulance officer, you could be um, a, a public servant in some other way. That's helping people. And I have so much respect for people in those doctors, nurses, all those incredible souls that choose that path. But if you're an entrepreneurship and you're telling people you want to help people, well, you know, I think you got to get real about the fact that you're not really going to help people unless you create financial wealth. And when you create a finan financial wealth, it means you're probably employing people. It means you've got discretionary income to go and um, give to causes that you care about. Two days ago, I was at a business breakfast here on the Gold Coast. A lot of wealthy Gold Coast business people there. They raised $140,000 over breakfast. Now, they wouldn't have done that if everybody in this room was broke, right? And that money was for the Gold Coast Community Fund, which goes to local Gold Coasters that are in pain, um, you know, women that are suffering from domestic violence issues and stuff like that. 
And as much as it would be nice to give that girl a cuddle and support her, she needs a roof over her head. She needs food for her baby that she's pulled out. And the only reason she stays with a guy who's beating her up is because she doesn't have the money to be out on her own. The money. She has everything, all the motivation to leave, but the money is what the man uses as the tool. So um, if you take that tool away from that man by you know, wealthy business people going, come over here, we are going to give you refuge with cash. That is really helping people. And it's only through entrepreneurship that you can express cash like that. But it doesn't mean it's more important than a doctor or a nurse, whatever. But if you're an entrepreneur, I think the best thing you can do is become successful financially. I, I couldn't agree more. We, we were just in Bali last week, about a couple of days ago. And we did, we took uh, my whole mastermind over there. We did an impact day. We supported a local safe house there raised a whole bunch of money for them and do these things. And then I, I sponsored a girl that yeah. Uh, yeah. put her through school. And I told her, I said, I said, how would you like it to never have to worry about like education for the rest, the rest of your life or the rest of your school? And she's like, what do you mean? You're going, you're going to year 12. Yeah. And I, and I saw it and she started crying and it was amazing. And I had this idea. I was like, it's so incredible that I can do that and not have to worry about how much it's going to cost and just better take care of it. And I put something on my Instagram and I was like, you all, I think, I think all of us do have an obligation to become as successful as we can. Yes. So you can do, go do epic shit like that. Yes. And a mentor once said to me, they're like, they're like, you, you see all these people who are like, I just want to save the rainforest and yada, yada, yada. And he said, he goes, if the goal is to really save the rainforest, go and make so much fucking money and just buy the damn thing. Yeah. Stop trying to chain yourself to a tree and try to change the world. Uh, and this is why I love entrepreneurship. Well, Steve Irwin did that. You know? Yeah. He, he did save our, not rainforest, but bought up right. thousands of acres of land for preservation from the wealth he created from his TV shows and everything he did. Yeah. But at the end of the day, no money, no land. Yeah. So you, one of the, one of the things you've done, you've crushed it in the e-commerce space, you crush it with the Amazon thing. You're one of the first people to sort of really help people crack into that market. And it's definitely still an industry that's booming at the moment. So many people want to get into e-commerce. So what is the most important thing someone's got to look out for if they want to get into the space of actually selling products online? Well, it's, it's in the space of selling anything, period, whether it's online or in business. The best um, blueprint that I've ever seen is from Alex Homozi. And, and this is basically what I taught. And then I heard Alex explain it in four steps. And the first step is feed a hungry crowd, right? So a lot of times, and this is the biggest mistake after having 17,000 students try to start Amazon businesses, that was the number one thing. They identified a niche on Amazon, but it could be a business on the Gold Coast or anywhere else they are, where it wasn't really a starving crowd that was waiting, that they were wanting to sell to, solving a real problem. So that's number one. So you got to have that. you got to have something that people are reaching over the counter to grab off you when you tell them about it, because business is hard enough as it is without having that really bettered down. The second thing is they've got to be able to afford what you're selling, right? So it's no good if they really, really need it, but they can't buy it. So if you start a resume writing service, 100% of your customers are unemployed. So, you know, even if if your resume writing service is the best in the world, it's going to get them a job. If they can't afford you, it's no good. The third thing is you need to be able to target them. So again, if, if they're hungry and they can afford it, but you can't reach them and target them online, well, then you're stuck. So I have a business that sells electric toilets, right? So I sell them online. And before I um, started, I worked out that in Australia, there's 12,000 searches a month for chemical camping toilets, right? So there's people looking for camping toilets. That's one of the niches we sell into. We now sell to mine. So we sell to BHP this week and so on. But I knew that there's a significant amount of search already happening on the internet in Australia for the exact product I sell. So I can market to them through Google. Now we do social advertising as well. And so you've got need, like genuine need. You've got ability to buy. You've got the ability to reach them. And the fourth one is sell into a growing market. Because if you're selling into a market that's declining, you have to be going forward just to stand still. So make sure you're going into a growing market. If you've got all four of those, but the most important of which is you're selling a product or service that is genuinely feeding a starving crowd, that's the biggest thing. I, I heard a rumor that one of the first things you started selling was like, a, a colon, I can't even say the word, a colon bag or something? A colon bag? Is that? <laughs> no, it's not a colon bag. So I used, to, I used to use that as an example of the kinds of products that I was encouraging people to buy, uh, sorry, to sell on marketplaces like Amazon because so often people come up and they're like, especially young people, right? They're like, 
I'm, I'm, I'm into fitness, so I'm going to sell fitness gear, or I'm going to sell supplements, or I'm going to sell makeup, or I want to sell lingerie because they're into that and it makes them sound good when they go to a barbecue. And I would say sell a urine bag, sell a bedside commode. You know, this is five years ago when I was teaching this. Sell stuff that's boring where the comp competition are big sellers that are like medical companies that haven't innovated in 50 years, don't know a thing about marketing. And then ironically, a year ago when I found these toilets, I ended up selling toilets. And the reason I launched it publicly on my Instagram, I said, all right, guys, I'm going to show you how to build a million dollar company selling toilets. And everyone's like, Adam's lost his mind. I'm like, it's perfect because it's boring. It's profitable. It has consumables on the back end, pardon the pun. And, um, and the competition is very limited because you don't get all those hotshot marketers. You try to sell supplements. Every man, his dog wants to sell supplements. Every woman and her dog wants to sell active wear uh, or makeup or sexy things that are going to look cool on Instagram. Nobody wants to say, I'm the guy that sells toilets. Well, I, I, you know, what I find sexy is profit. I like to take long romantic walks to the bank. I don't care about whether it makes me look sexy or anything else. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm attached to that. And I want to play the side of someone who is listening to this going, oh, but you just crushed this dream because I had this idea. I wanted to create the best active wear. I know there's lots out there, but isn't there still room for the best in the market? What's your advice to someone who wants to kind of go against everything you just said? because they have something that they just think could be the best well in that particular niche for example in active wear it's really about brand right if you think about it like the kardashians with their skims it's about the skims brand and the distribution arguably there's plot probably lots of products that are easily available that you could probably get the people who make skims yourself but can you make a better brand and can you get distribution if you look at simon beard with culture kings you know, he's selling t-shirts and shorts and jeans, but his, his brilliance was his inability to create a brand and experience that when you went in those stores, it was theater. Young men, he knew exactly who he was targeting. It was like going to a nightclub when you would walk into his stores. But at the end of the day, their t-shirts, their jeans, their caps, but the kids who were his customers bought into the brand, which he was absolutely nailed. Him and Tani, very, very smart people who, who deserve all their success. So it's about brand. What do, you, what do you see as the biggest struggle for entrepreneurs right now? Um, it, it's definitely being um, dispassionate about their idea selection. You know, the, it's like with a marriage, people say, you know, what's, what's the key to a successful marriage? And um, the older people who've been together for years will say, oh, it's, it's easy. The, the, the secret is choose the right person, <laughs> right? That, there it is. It's not like go for a walk on the beach every day or make sure you look. No, choose the right human being for you. If you choose the right human being, the rest is just on the margins, right? You can't fix broken. And so many people start with, oh, I'm going to make this active wear. And the, and the really good test that I say to people is this, if you're thinking about developing a product or service, imagine that it's all done, right? Let's, you know, let's say that you, you're going to launch Dream um, uh, Energy Drinks, Dream Out Loud Energy Drinks. Now, for the person who's developing this, they get all excited about the logo. They get all excited about the colors. They get, you know, all that stuff when you're young. So imagine day one that it's all done. You've got this beautiful energy drink sitting on the counter right now. What has to happen in order for that to be sold, right? And, and and it's a rhetorical question. Like they then have to think about, okay, well, how do I actually make, oh, I've got to go down to Woolworths and try and pitch it to Woolies. Okay, well, how long is that going to take to get the meeting? Is it going to be you or is it going to be somebody else? What is it cost to move that product? And have that discussion now and really think through now about distribution and sales because people think, well, once I've got this thing, it's just going to happen. No, somebody has to actually go and make those transactions happen. And that somebody is probably going to need to be paid. How much do they cost? How long is it going to take to get in the door? And can you float your business long enough for that to happen and turn into a real business? So I encourage people to go to the day one before they even start and ask the real commercial questions about distribution and sales first. It's all the non-sexy uh, stuff. Non-sexy stuff. Non-sexy stuff. I... Every time I run a business mastermind, I'll ask the question. I'll say, what's the first thing? What's the most important thing in business? First thing you should do. And I've, I've waited as long as 10, 15 minutes. And just all these answers are coming up. You need a website. You need your logo. You need this here, this here, this. I'm like, 
what you need is just go fucking make money. Yeah. Just go sell your shit somehow to someone and just prove the concept's actually going to work. Yeah. Take the money, make things better. It's almost a form of procrastination to just getting ready to get ready. 100%. To get ready. Um, what does it actually take to really make it? Well, in my case, I was a bit of a slow learner, right? So people tend to look at it now and they hear the story, okay, you, you had that big success selling um, online courses and you've had, I sold an anim, built and sold an animation company in Los Angeles. I built it from scratch. I sold it um, in 2015. I've had a few wins, not many. And when people just say, oh, you know, you, you were really successful at e-commerce, I was moderately successful as an e-commerce seller. I never sold that I was a Simon Beard or um, a Bondi Sands. Or There's much, much more successful e-commerce sellers than me. My business partner, Eric, has a $100 million a year e-commerce company based here on the Gold Coast, 175 staff. So it's far more successful. I, I just knew how to find a good product and scale it to a few million dollars a year. And, that, and I educated people how to do that. And that's where most of the market was. And so I had significant success as an educator because I worked with where most people were. Most people can't imagine going to, 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 a, to a hundred million dollar a year business. But um, what it really takes it, for me is I had only a few wins and you only have to be right a few times in your life um, and a lot of failures. So for me, when I look back, as Steve Jobs said, you only connect the dots looking back on your life. My superpower is persistence. I just kept going. Like Winston Churchill said, the key to, to success is being kicked in the nuts over and over and not losing enthusiasm. <laughs> right? Yeah. They might not be the exact words, but that's the meaning. And so I just kept going because I was like, I am not, I am unemployable. I, I have, I can't do a job. I literally cannot get up in the morning and go in and a boss tells me, this is where you got to turn up. This is when you go, this is what you got to do for me. And that's it. I just, I can't do that. I just, it, it would like, it'd be like me changing my sexuality. I just can't do it, right? No matter how much I try, I like what I like, right? So, and that's what it is in entrepreneurship, same, same deal. So that being the case, I just kept going until I figured stuff out and I kept making mistakes. And the best, the only way most people learn is when they lose and they had something on the line significant. Um, you can't really learn unless you go out and fall and then go again, and, and it's through pain that you develop the real learnings. So speaking of pain, so in 2008, you went from over $10 million net worth to nearly bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about what actually happened there, but what were those days like? Yeah, it happened pretty quick. I was, it was 2008, everything was booming, leading into the, the collapse in 2008. Everyone was like, wow, how good is this? Happy days. Of course, 2008 came along. You would have been too young at that time for, for that. I was in school. I did. You were in school, so you missed that one. But um, where I had my wealth was I owned about five houses here on the Gold Coast, investment properties, um, and I had just listed my company um, and, and had an eight-figure stake in that business, but it was only just listed four months before, so my shares were escrowed. We were a small cap. It got wiped out pretty much. Uh, everybody bailed. The share price went to almost nothing. Uh, my shares were escrowed. Um, what does escrowed mean? Uh, oh, escrowed means you can't sell your shares because you're a founder. So for the first two years, your shares are locked up. So you can't liquidate them. You have to own yep. them. You, ca you can't, you can't. In other words, it stops people from listing yep. their company and dumping the shares on the market and see you later. So um, the, the shares became worth nothing. The company, we were in early stage capital raising um nobody wanted to invest in early stage companies at that time so our revenues fell through the floor we hired we fired sorry uh 80 of our workforce in three months most of it happened in the first day and i was retired as the ceo leading into the ipo we brought uh, another um a, a, you know a legit ceo a proper ceo in before we uh, did the listing and I'd not retired, but I'd left the business. And uh, then the CEO went back to Sydney and I stepped back into the CEO role, sold my five investment properties to put into the company to pay creditors and save the company I worked for two years for free. And it sent me back to zero, you know, and um, I lent the money unsecured to the, to the company because it needed cash immediately. And so it was brutal. Like one, one day I'm flying high, I've got an eight figure net worth, a founder of a um, co-founder of a, a now public company. And then six months later, I was, um, I started a, a business and was being the CEO, I was moonlighting as a CEO in the, in the 
company that were lift, listed and I was door knocking, selling a marketing service door to door to pay my bills. Um, literally walking up and down the streets of the Gold Coast, knocking on small businesses saying, can I help you with your marketing and trying to get $300 a month retainers. And that's how I got through. How, how'd that feel for you to do that? Horrendous. And it was terrifying. Like I, I remember the first day I had a flip chart and again, cause I couldn't get a job. I could, how am I going to get a job? Who's going to employ a guy who founded a public company and is now down and out? Like they know he's going to leave. Mm. They're not going to feel comfortable having me lurking around, right? They don't. So I had to go down the first street I ever knocked was James Street in Burley, uh, the, all the cafes. And I, and I was nervous. I'd lost all my confidence and I'd walk in and try and get an appointment say, Hey, can I help you with your marketing? Um, and it was humbling and, um, it's funny, I'll tell you, just the, the first day I did it, I walked up and down the, the coffee shops and I didn't go into a single business because I was so afraid of being rejected that I went back to my car and I had my flip chart that I'd printed out. And uh, I was about to start the car and I looked down, and I was telling myself, okay, you've done the surveillance, you'll come back tomorrow, we'll start, right? Putting it off a day, right? Yep. And in my head, something at that moment, I just said this, it wasn't in my head, it was actually in my gut. And my gut at that moment said, Adam, if you don't get back out of the car right now, you and I both know that this is it. You're going to have to go get a job because you're going to do exactly the same thing tomorrow. The enemy you get. Yeah. And time, fate and circumstance sort of held a hasty meeting and were watching me, I think, to see at that moment, is he going to go back to being an employee for the rest of his life or is he going to go and do this? And I was just so nervous. And I got back out of the car and said, you know what, Adam? Fuck this. You've got no other choice. So I went down. I knocked on the first door. And the guy said, yes, yeah. so it was $300 a month retainer. And I knocked on a whole bunch of other doors that day. By the end of the day, I had two customers, $600 a month. By the end of the first month, I had about $4,000 of retainer income by just cold calling, knocking on Gold Coast business doors. And that got me out of the shit, got me through. And then about two years later, I ended up selling my stake in the business and moving to America. What, what was that business? That was the one where I was door knocking. The one that went down. Oh, it was a capital raising company. It was a, called the Australian Small Scale Offerings Board. So we did um, uh, early stage capital raising for unlisted companies. So we'd organize their structure, help show them how to raise capital, and we'd take a commission on the funds raised. See, so many, so many people would have... Um collapsed so many people have gone back or, or let the fear were, were you afraid then oh totally everything like at that moment i was in my mid to late 30s and leading into that i thought yes i've been that crazy guy for 15 years all my mates went into corporate or jobs and they were now making 400 grand a year in good corporate jobs they were getting big digs into their mortgage they were paying down their homes they had a few investment properties I'd had very limited up and down wins uh, leading into that. And I was like, I made it. I knew entrepreneurship was the way. And then it all went away. And I was door knocking with mm. no thing. With I, the, I got down to $4,000 net worth. $4,000 in my late 30s, which is just a disaster when you've worked your whole life without a safety net. Yeah. Um, that's, that's where I got to. I nearly had to ask my girlfriend's father for a loan. What happened to that, right? Was that mostly because of the crash or was it like looking back on it now, knowing what you know now, could you have prevented that happening or was it just, if it had happened again, it's just the circumstances of the world. First of all, I probably would have never taken it public, right? Like I, I just didn't have enough information at that time. I thought taking a public company was a company public was the Holy grail. And I've since become a lot wiser and understand it. I'm not a lot better than I did at the time. So I probably wouldn't have taken it public at all. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, we were in a we were in a mar we had a business where we raised money for early stage companies. And when the economy's booming and there's just money left, right, and center, everybody's making money. They're like, "Yeah, I'll put fifty grand into that startup that my friend has started, and I'll put a hundred grand in that." We we're raising millions of dollars for these really risky companies, right? And it was all happy because everybody was like making money on paper. And then 2008 hit, the tide went out. We find out who's swimming naked, as Warren Buffett says. And people are just not spending money or investing money in that sector at all, right? Uh, all the money rushed to safety assets, which we were selling the antithesis of safety assets. So our business just revenues collapsed, share price collapsed. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I honestly, I, I don't know that I would do what I did again. Like I, I took everything that I'd, 
had outside of the business and lent it to the company to save it. And it was a very thankless job. I was to pay employee entitlements and all that stuff. As a public company, I wasn't the CEO at the time. I hadn't been for a year. I was just a shareholder. Um, I don't know if I'd do it again, but I did. Uh, it worked out ultimately okay, but it was, it was a horrendous time. What's up, Dream Nation? Have you ever wondered how far ahead your life would have already been if you had got access to this type of content at a younger age? Look, this is why I need your help. I'm trying to build the number one personal development platform out there to teach you guys the tips, tricks, and attitude of what it takes to live your dream life and to bring the type of education that we all wish we had in school. This show only grows by word of mouth and new subscribers. So it would mean the world to me if you could smash that subscribe button right now, leave us a five-star written review or drop a comment below and share this episode with a friend. I would be forever grateful. All right, now let's get back into this episode. See, it's so interesting because as I'm, because I'm obviously 30, never got to that point. And I would be lying if I said that that isn't like a lingering, I guess, fear that hopefully one day nothing like that happens. And knowing what you know now, I guess, well, what would you say to me then to make sure, because someone listening to this would, would think like the same thing as what you were just saying, like, how can you go from having this eight figure net worth to then completely, because people would think, well, you've got everything, you've got this happening, yeah. this happening. Uh, and at least I do anyway. It's like, if I got to that sort of net worth, I would think I'd be somewhat invincible as well. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of advice have you got to for people to protect themselves better, to be more financially secure? So even if like, like that happened, they've still... Yeah, I mean, I, I could have said, I'm not going to sell my properties and save the business. And I would have had, I don't know what I had out in the properties. Maybe I maybe had a million dollars of equity in the properties or maybe a million five or two. So I can't remember. It was a while ago now. So one, one to two million dollars. Had I you know, not done that. And, but I, I was selling them at the worst possible time. Maybe there's a yeah. damn bunch, right? So I fire sold them to get the cash for the business. That was the thing that really put me on my ass. Mm. Um, I could have lost the equity in the business and sort of gone, all right, well, I'm still a millionaire. Um, but I didn't because I was like, no, I, you know, I, I'm thinking about it now. It's the first time I thought about it in a while. It was probably one of the biggest motivators. I had family and friends money in the business who, who had invested in that company. Um, and so I felt this obligation to save it for me reputationally and also to save it for them. And as a result, looking back, I, I probably did a good thing because it didn't fail. It's certainly not under my watch. I don't know what has happened to it now. It's merged and it was acquired and other things have gone on, but it didn't fail under my watch completely. We turned it around, saved it, restored it to profitability and stuff. So I didn't have that black mark on my history, which yeah. was good. Um, but it cost me everything. Yeah. So I don't know, looking back, because I, I probably could have said, well, look, I, I, I've been gone for a year, you know, yeah. and um, I didn't have to do that, but I did. I don't know if I'd do it again. Do but it be again. diverse. I mean, if you diversified, that's great, but it just wasn't in my nature to do that. I was yeah. like, I just don't want the black mark. Yeah. Um, but it happens, you know, and it can happen quite easily, especially if a lot of your net worth is tied up in a, in a public company like that, that's speculative and early. Um, and then everything else that I had in property went into that. So, yeah. What's been the most scariest moment in business for you, except for that, if that was it? Uh, I, I mean, that, that was probably it. You know, it was sitting down with a CEO, like we got a phone call, my business partner and I who founded the company, we got a phone call saying, Hey, I need to meet you, meet with you. This is the CEO. And we met in surface paradise in a hotel lobby and she'd only been running the company for six months or nine months and she was like oh, we need you guys to put some money in i'm like why right we just we just went public you know i was making you know good money i was making six figures a month profit leading into the the ipo why do we need money well you know things have slowed down you know and i'm like okay where are we at exactly she goes well i'm not i'm not really sure but i'm going to sydney um, tonight and, um, maybe think about how much you can put into the business. And I'm like, oh my God, how bad is this? And so then I call a friend of mine who's a CPA and I said, I need to meet you here in the offices now. What's a CPA? Uh, chartered practicing accountant, an okay. accountant. Yeah. Okay. So well, an accountant. Yeah. And, and a guy who'd run public companies before. Good. So I met him at the office with the CEO's permission and we went through how much the company owed, what the creditors were. <laughs> 
and it was like a total shit show. Like we owed more money than we had in the bank and it had been run down to a, you know, a very, very unhealthy place. Um, so, you know, we, we did not have enough money to last a week of obligations. So that was a very scary moment. And that's when we fired people and, you know, I was rattling tins to pay staff and saying, we can't afford you, you know, there's no money here. Wild. Do you have any regrets? Yeah. Um, probably on, only, I got married a year ago, um, to, to my lovely wife. Uh, I wish I'd met her earlier, um, because I don't have any kids. I'm 50 and, um, uh, yeah, so that's probably the one thing I would have liked to maybe have a family with her, but, um, yeah, it wasn't to be, but that was about the only thing I would have liked is maybe a, a family. Can you still have, Tony Robbins just had a fucking kid. Yeah, yeah, there are options. It depends. We can't have kids, but right. yeah, but um, it would have, if it was an option for us, we probably would have had yeah. a kid, yeah. So what I think would be cool to talk about, so right now, we're, so we're sitting in your brand new office, you've told me you've just really invested in this, getting this place going, you're about to launch your own podcast and you're also doing a media company. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of unpack your brain as to, because it's cool when people listen to this, it's like, well, that's what you've done in the past. And what I want them to really understand is what's your strategy right now? So talk us through from the idea of creating this whole media company and podcast to where we're at right now and your plan for the next year with this as a business. Yeah. Walk us through that. Yeah. I, uh, I think in sort of next 10 years rather than next years. Um, so I, I'm at a place now in my life where I'm, um, for me, I'm gen genuinely financially free. So I, I've, I have enough income from my assets that I don't need to do business anymore, um, which is a really privileged and lovely place to exist because you get to do things in a different headspace. Um, you, you don't have as much pressure. So this is a genuine passion project for me, and it's really the first time in my life that I've been at that place where I can do something I'm genuinely passionate about. I love educating people. I love talking to smart people. Um, so doing a podcast just sounds like a lot of fun to me, right? Just just being able to grow your network. And my friend Matt Purcell in Sydney, who I, I think is a really smart guy around social and, and personal branding, he gives a really good example that the Eiffel Tower in Paris um, sells about $90 million a year of tickets, which isn't a lot when you think of the Eiffel Tower. It doesn't, like I said, Eric, my business partner, his econ business here on the Gold Coast does more than the mm -hmm. Eiffel Tower, right? But the Eiffel Tower b brings billions of dollars of value to the city. So a personal brand, or I think by extension, a podcast, when you've got that audience, it's not what the podcast makes from downloads. It's the opportunities and it's the ways that you can monetize it long term are enormous. I think there is a fundamental shift in the media landscape that's happening right now. Uh, I think... Uh, mainstream media is dying. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense as a business in the world we live in now. Uh, now the consumer can choose what they want to learn about. So they go to YouTube and they listen to podcasts and they're on their phones all day and they're, they're consuming information at an unprecedented rate. So, so I think there's a fundamental shift in the media landscape and eyeballs and attention are moving away from mainstream media and to independent media. And so, um, Media companies are hard, uh, getting attention and keeping it um, through a podcast or a video podcast. It's to compete, like with the likes of a diary of the CEO or that some of these top podcasts, it, it costs money. You know, that, that's the bottom line. You know, as we were talking off camera, we spent 300 grand just in the fit out in here and we haven't even started. We'll have five full-time staff from January on for the listeners we're recording in December right now or just about to end December. So we'll have five full-time staff, you know, rent, everything else, and it won't make money for probably at least a couple of years. Mm. So you've got to be able to float that for a while. Um, and you've got to be interesting. You've got to be entertaining. It's, it's, it's a high bar and it's a serious commitment. But I believe that um, those who um, are prepared to invest and do have a vision for it um, can do extremely well. And I think a, a really telling sign, if you look to the US, for example, uh, Patrick Bet David, who's a big podcaster that I follow, he's got 74 staff on his podcast. 
does he? Yeah, 70, 70. 74 in his, well, when I say his podcast, his media business, but they're, they're building a two acre studio at the moment, but he's getting 500 million views a month. So that is more than any major TV network. Three presidential candidates um, uh, have announced their run on his podcast this election cycle. Wow. So that is a major shift. You know, Ron DeSantis, Vivek um, as well. These guys went on the podcast to announce. In days gone by, it would be CNN or NBC or something like that. So that is significant. You know, when you've got 500 million, you look at Mr. Beast, you know, Mr. Beast, his problem now is he can't find an advertiser that will pay him what he's worth because he's getting seven times the audience of a Super Bowl per video. Yeah. Um, so, and you look at what a Super Bowl ad goes for, it's $5 million US per 30 seconds or $7 million per 30 seconds. He has seven times that audience for 20 minutes, right? So how can you pay for that? So Mr. Beast is now going into fast moving consumables like feastables. Yeah. So he, he makes about 50 or $60 million a year from revenue from his videos, which he puts a hundred percent back into the videos. But year number one with his chocolate bars, he did 200 million. So, and that's a, a 200 million of a $4 billion market in the U S. So he, um, you know, because he's got attention, he's going to become, he's already a billionaire, but he'll be an extremely wealthy guy because he's created content at scale. Yeah. Same with Logan Paul. Logan Paul and uh, you see what, I think what Jake Paul's doing is, I think Jake Paul's more entrepreneurial than Logan Paul copies, but I like what Jake Paul's doing actually in the boxing world. Then he created a betting company. Yeah. And he created an actual promotional company. And look at Logan's done with Primed. Yeah. Uh, Primed. Like it. Yeah. Once, once you've got attention, but it, you've got to, the media game is is different, right? Like there's a lot of young people have um, relevancy. People are paying attention, but they don't have credibility, right? Yeah. So relevancy can be gained through um, short form TikTok type stuff. And you might have 2 million followers, but you can't monetize it. Whereas a long form podcast, like what you're doing and like what we're going to be doing, if something like someone spends an hour or two hours each time they listen to you, that creates a depth. Yeah. And that depth can be monetized. It's very hard to monetize surface level attention, right? Mm -hmm. The Kardashians have surface level attention, but they have that at such monumental scale, but they also have their TV show, which is yeah. depth, yeah. right? So you need to have both if you want to sort of monetize. So tell us, okay, so, because I want these guys to sort of understand like inside the brain of Adam right now through the production of, of creating this. So you had the idea, so... Straight away, you're like, if I'm going to do it, we're going to fucking kill it. So if we're 300 grand into this thing, walk us through the bit of the plan. You said you've got a 10 year plan for this as like the new business. Mm. What's your ideas? What's your plan of how are you thinking right now? And going like, this is my attitude and my approach to actually doing all this. Yeah. Good question. So it's hard to, when, when I mentioned it to you off camera, that this is what 300 grand looks like when you sink it into the walls, you're like, holy shit, really? It's like. This desk that we're sitting at is yeah. custom made, built on site. You know, this here alone is probably fifteen grand just for the top and the bench. You know, <laughs> um, the mentality behind it is we want to build a studio, a bit like pro property developers say, build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. We want top level guests, and so we want them when they walk in. The reason we have those TVs behind you there is when they walk in, I want to have their face on those screens with a graphic made up welcoming them to the studio. I want them to feel amazing when they come. I want them to walk in and go, holy shit, you guys are not messing around. I want them to feel like we are serious about amplifying their message because we are. We're gonna, we're gonna create trailers. We've got a full-time guy starting in four weeks whose only job is cutting trailers of each podcast interview, which will then run traffic to certain ones that are real kick-ass pods. Um, so we're gonna invest into that business um, in, in the hopes that they will then also go, you know, get that content out on their socials for us. So we want to really provide a platform that goes deeper than others have done. And I feel that at the age of 50, I have insights and views on things that I didn't have when I was 20, right? Yeah. You'll notice there's four seats around this table. I did that because if you look at any major TV show, whether it be Sex in the City yep. or any of those, they're usually multi-talent. And the reason they do that is so that everybody watching can identify with at least one of the characters. 
So I got three other guys that are all very different to me. And I want the audience to relate to one of the four of us at least. So maximum exposure of personality types and so on. And it's got to be entertaining. So it can't just be educational. It has to be entertaining. So these are all mates of mine. We play poker together and we're all entrepreneurs and we're all unemployable, right? So what we're trying to do is create an audience of people that relate to our vibe um, that we serve. And I've just hired four researchers this week who are researching for us. So because we've got this main panel but we've got two other types of content. One of those other types is long, medium form, 20 minute special interest, sorry, pieces. So I hire a researcher, for example, on um, the EV uh, market in Australia. Like uh, there's a lot of interest in that. Immigration, electric vehicles okay. or, or immigration policies in Australia and how they might affect us as business people. So I've, I've got a full researcher just on that, getting all the data together so that we're well-researched when we're talking. And I really feel Australia is underserved in a content creation channel for self-employed entrepreneurs, self-directed investors about what's happening in this country at a deep level so that we can make informed decisions about where we invest our money, what types of businesses we start, because Australia is undergoing a massive amount of change right now. Um, so we want to bring together experts and people and create content that is not available on, you know, channel nine or channel 10 yep. or, or anything else, um, because they're not focused on a singular audience. They're focused on mainstream Australia. Mm. You know, I'm not focused on mainstream Australia. I'm focused on the crazy bastards who want to be self-employed and then beyond Australia. And there's a lot of them. Yeah. Who's your favorite entrepreneur right now? Elon Musk. Because he's a psycho. <laughs> like, no, I just love that Elon is just, there's not been a brain like that. Mm. He is our Henry Ford. He's our industrialist of our age. Very rare um, to, to have an Elon Musk, you know, like what he is doing is absolutely remarkable across a range of industries. The, the brain on that guy and the balls on that guy is just beyond um, and his, if you read the latest book that Walter Isaacson wrote about him, Walter does all the top biographies. He did Steve Jobs' biography. He's done all of them. It's an amazing book. You would just not, you think you know Elon Musk until you read this book. You're like, man, this guy's insane. Like his mm. vision, his standards, his ability to recruit are just off the charts. What, what do you do for, so how many, how many companies do you have right now? Uh, I'll look actively probably th three or four. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, companies in the sense of like businesses, yeah. um, I, I've got the toilets, right. Which yeah, I, yeah. which I started really as a teaching tool. I wanted to show the audience, Hey, you can still start a business in 2002 or 23 selling built toilets. And we started in March this year, this month we did a hundred thousand for the month. Um, it's nine months old, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I did that. Um, that's a trading business. I've got my investment company. So I have invested in a few things and then I've got this and that's it for now. So how do you, how do you manage your time? and your energy amongst all these different things? Um, I, I've, I've worked four days a week for quite a long time now. So I work Monday to Thursday. Fridays is a personal day, just for health and just relaxing and Saturday and Sunday. And then Monday to Friday, Monday to Thursday I work. Um, I start early. So I start most days at about 4 a.m. Uh, I'm up and working. I'll work through till about 7 and I'll have, um, I'll have, um, then I'll do my exercise and then I, I'll go back to work at eight and then I'll work all day, come home, spend some time, uh, about five o'clock. I'll come, come home, spend a couple of hours with my wife and then go to bed and I'm in bed by nine. So that's sort of my day. And then I might work out in the afternoon sometimes, you know, at about two o'clock when there's the gym quietens down. So in the days though, like how, how do you actually manage the energy? Like how do you know, or what have you found amongst your years of going, like what makes you perform at the best ability? Cause yeah, because right now I've got three companies and the podcast. Podcast is a business, and I'm just learning daily how to actually just like and I've, I'm starting to theme my days where it's like on this day you can't talk to me like my sister. Everyone knows you can't talk to me about these things. Yeah, unless it's like this is on fire, but this is just not. It's a different theme. So I even have days where I only do podcast interviews. So Thursdays and Fridays are the only times I'll do podcast interviews, not not any other day because I just stay in that 
theme where I'm like, hey, today is just this. Yeah. Do you do anything like that? My biggest hack for me anyway is you've got to have time to do deep work where you are totally undistracted. And for me, that is from four in the morning till seven in the morning. Those three hours, I can get done in those three hours what most people would get done in three days mm. because I'm, I've just woken up. Um, I've got zero distractions and that's where I'll get in and, and just smash it. And then there's admin sort of from eight o'clock to 10 o'clock, you know, and then I'll do some more work, but not as dense as what it's been in the morning. Two o'clock, I might go to the gym, a few more admin things at the end of the day, and then I'm home. But most of my work, it's, I think most people are really, most people are really productive for three or four hours tops mm. in a day. And you've got to make sure that those three or four hours, you're not distracted. And so, you know, that's when I get so much done important. And I try to tackle the the important things rather than the urgent things as much as I can, push the urge, the urgent things to, to sort of... How do you yeah. decide for them? Because how do you like focus on when things just come across your desk? You're like, oh, I've got to... Well, you know, right? Like you, 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 you sort of tend to understand after a while that what you're doing today, if you're operating in the right way, those things that you do today that matter are going to pay off in two or three years, right? Like, um, so you got to, quite often the things are going to make the biggest difference. Uh, you put them off because you know that it's not going to be an immediate payoff, but you know, long-term it will be like creating systems, writing and training your staff, um, that sort of stuff. There's always urgent stuff like getting back to that email, getting back to this. And a lot of times entrepreneurs get caught up in clearing their inbox and it takes their clearest time of day they start clearing the inbox if they're up at 4 a.m it's just such a waste of that precious uninterrupted clear-headed thinking time so doing the the stuff that you know is going to move the needle in the in the long term financially tackle those things first mm. not the urgent matters make them admin where do you see ai where do you see ai actually going in the next five ten years for every day-to-day person and us as entrepreneurs. Yeah, AI, look, I wouldn't profess to be an AI. I've spent a bit of time in chat GPT-4 and um, so on. There's certainly a lot of people that are smarter than me, but I think AI is going to be, that's this generation's internet. You know, yeah. like for my generation, the internet was revolutionary. AI is going to be revolutionary. Um, and I think there's going to be enormous change as a result of AI. Um, I honestly don't know the full depth of it, but it's going to be substantial. Um, and I would just encourage young people coming up. I think really that's got to be on your decision tree when you're going to be starting something. How likely is what I'm about to be doing going to be disrupted by AI? Um, there's things like cleaning roofs, right? And emptying garbage trucks and, AI is not going to do that, you know, crawling through crawl spaces. And so I think those businesses in the future are going to be extremely profitable. Um, and there's, there's a lot of talent being attached, a lot of attention being attracted to um, AI, but a lot of the, it's very short term, but like you go and create an AI solution and then it's hard to monetize because 50 other guys just did the same thing. Yeah. You know, what's a sustainable, defensible AI business? Um, and those are going to be things for people to think about. Adam, this has been fun. Yeah. I think that was like entrepreneurship 101. <laughs> <laughs> Everything in that. Um, where can everybody find you on social media? Best is just my Instagram, which is uh, Adam Hudson Official. And uh, that, that's probably the best. Our website is unemployable.com.au. It's pretty crap, the website at the moment, because we're kicking it up next year. It's just sort of a placeholder. But um, those are the two spots. Beautiful. All right, let's wrap this up. I've got a final question. Yeah. If you were to go back to your 18-year-old self and give him 30 seconds of advice, what would it be? 18-year-old uh, self, 30 seconds of advice. Um, I would probably just say stick with it. Don't be afraid to fail fast um, and, uh, and be patient. And the product matters. <laughs> the product or the service really matters.